Oh, well, hi, neighbor. Welcome to the program. Hi, everybody. I, uh, I'm just plugging away on uh, some stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a good weekend. I like a good, productive weekend. And so that's, uh, you know, you get stuff done around the house. You get stuff done for your errands. And you get to spend some quality familial time. And uh, and at the same time, it lets uh, you feel a little productive for that creative energy you have inside yourself. You want to get that stuff out too. So, uh, yeah, we uh, we did a fun thing on the weekend. We did a trip to the local supply store. Art supplies! And uh, I picked up some crazy, silly stuff with the kids. Uh, we had them visiting this weekend, so that was fun. The two oldest, anyways. And uh, so I picked up some some gel gloss medium. Oh, Nelly. I'm excited about that. Going to be doing some fun things. But I also found some of this. And this was exciting for me because uh, I picked up some stuff for myself. Uno momento, si will play. Um, I picked up some some little stamps and things and so i used these little stamp pads that i got for a couple of bucks each and if you can find some of these hey, hey right because these are awesome they afford you opportunities opportunity so and i got some silly stamps of uh leaves right and so using these two things coupled with once this stuff dries, right, it's waterproof. And I can't tell you how excited I am about having some ink that's waterproof when dry. So, all right. And uh, so I've got, uh, oh, we've got somebody seeing something already. Oh, Gary. Hi, Gary. Afternoon, dude. Um, so the stamps that I bought, the silly little stamps from their supply store and the silly little stamp pads that I bought, coupled with the nice new orange ink that I picked up for myself. Uh, I went and uh, had some creative fun. And so I messed up the surface of a piece of paper, a yellow piece of paper. I did all this jazz on it with the stamps. And then I went in with a white pen, the standard old, um, now I can't remember what the heck those pens are called. Well, anyways, um, the jelly roll, the jelly pens. And hey, Phil, how you doing, buddy? Welcome aboard. And so I outlined some of the stamping areas. I took these pencil crayons that I was playing with with the grandkids, these uh, color erase pencils that are really hard. And they do not... Uh, they do not make a heavy mark on the surface. They do a really light mark on the surface of the paper, as long as you're uh, gentle with them and not punching holes and everything you've ever you've ever touched. But so with that and the little Jelly Roll white pen, I played with those simple stamps and the simple little pads, and that's where I did the one panel for the page that I did uh, on Sunday, which was uh, which one was it? This one. Just one second. This is the uh, Sunday page that I did called You've Earned This. And so you can see that how that panel fits in there now. I also did a drawing of a uh, of former Prince Harry uh, dressed as a court jester and uh, upside down, inverted. It's the fool. Uh, so that uh, for the same piece. But uh, this is a piece that was done for Sunday night. And uh, well, making crafts with the kids. And then uh, we got a chance to see uh, Gary's show and take part with that really briefly for, for a couple minutes on Saturday. That was super cool. I uh, get to talk with the Gary and, and Scott circling. That was pretty cool. Uh, this is the piece that I did this morning. This is from a pre existing drawing that I already had that I did nothing with. Um, it was for a piece that I did some time ago. And uh, subsequently, this is the next one that I'm doing. So, yeah, you know. But in the interim, I have been working today on this sucker. And so what this is, is uh, 
it's a, a drawing of a kid going, Jay Willikers, mister, right? And uh, I, I, I'm calling this, uh, this one's uh, Fish Tales. And so, you know, that's the Fish Tales, right? And uh, so I'm going to make a play on that, and I'm going to do a, a little bit of fun. Call it Fish Tailing, which I know is not grammatically correct, but... Uh, I'm having some fun with it where this guy is clearly telling a, a baloney story about how big the fish was that he caught and how much it weighed. Uh, but uh, for me, the fun part of that is uh, how offended the fish is going to be uh, by the weight that he suggested it weighs. Because that's how Chris turns everything sideways. So, yeah, so it's uh, it's kind of fun to play with different ideas of stuff and to to associate how we might uh, approach our images in such a way as to 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 really round them out and to really make them all that we can but at the same time and and I think this is a large part of how I go about my perspective on where do I take that next is that I don't you might try to execute your work in, in whatever degree of mature professionalism, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be serious <laughs> when it comes to the dialogue. And it, and I, the piece that I posted today of, uh, of like a bolt of, uh, it's, what's it called? Strikes? What do I call it? It strikes like a bolt of lightning. Is uh, is a piece that is honestly a little more a little more serious in that regard. But uh, I don't lock my step in uh, lock step myself into having to to do everything with a, either a, a pithy approach or a, well any approach. I, I really don't lock my st step myself into anything. I'm just exploring. So it was really exciting to be able to talk with uh, with Gary um Hodges and Scott Circland I I don't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday because that's how my days go I think it was Saturday yeah I think it was Saturday and um uh, about uh fun versus rewarding I believe was Gary uh Hodges uh, uh topic and if you get an opportunity anybody that 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 watches this to go and check that out please do um because uh it's interesting to hear about how other people work and you know, my hope is that when I came in and, and talked really briefly about process, I didn't come in like a maniac. I hope, you know, I just, uh, the way that uh, I process the working um, facility that I have for expression is, is I realize a, a, a tag unconventional. So I was just trying to express that. That, uh, and it comes from having done and continuing to do a lot, you know, of, of uh, exploration and different things. Like this piece here, uh, I'm drawing these fish, or I'm sorry, this fish, in uh, pencil crayon. For the most part, I'm going to hit it, belt it with a little bit of white in a second just to put lots of nice dots on this. Uh, I think it's a sturgeon. Uh, I am not a fishing guy. But... Uh, Playing with uh, the idea of uh, of this a little farther, though, is that the next half of this this because I like working mixed and because I like working in different materials. While this is ball uh, a pencil crayon piece, uh, the next half of this image is going to be uh, watercolor. And so, what actually has happened is that this is two pieces of paper together. It's just a eight and a half by eleven cardstock that I picked up on on Sunday, and uh, sorry, I am still struggling with a cold, and I apologize. So, so with that, um, the idea for the image, and I hope that this you can see this. Is this in camera? Yeah, it is. Down here at the bottom of the of the page, as you see, I'm scribbling here. The idea is that in panel one, here's this kid saying what. Golly gee, mister, and his dialogue about the fish story that he's being told by uh, his pa here. Now, 
in drawing this, I realize that uh, what I'm actually going to do is flip the image of dad because I really like the idea of of uh, the dialogue between our the two characters to be facing each other. So, and this is the wonderful thing that that uh, scanning things and putting them into the computer affords me is that I then have the opportunity, the option to take something and I've drawn one way and just flip it over, just flip it horizontally to face the opposite direction. And I think that because of uh, affordances that we have now, because of the technology of the day, it allows us to rearrange compositionally how we set up a page. It allows us to um, reassess the layout that we might have initially had in mind. So, and, and it allows us to, to not have to start over with crap again and allows us to not have to, you know, take a step back from what we've already accomplished because that's, that's just infuriating to me. So, okay, so the page is going to be when it's rectangular format and I'm going to, so I want to try to make a unique individual authentic different pages for each one page comic story that I do. And so what I'm going to set up is uh, I'm trying to make this so it's straight with the, the image to some extent. I don't know if I've just made it worse or what I've done, but who cares? Anyway, so uh, so in this, this page and its layout that I have developing in my head as I'm drawing is uh, the, the text or the title is going to be at the bottom of the page. And then the image, because I love layering images now. So as the dialogue is here from the little boy and the dialogue is here from dad, and then the dialogue is here from the fish, right? Um, in behind, in the background, let me find a different color to example this. Uh, should not be so difficult to pick a different color. Anyway, so in the background, I'm going to have, uh, this is what I'm going to do in watercolor in two seconds, is that I'm going to paint a school of fish. And so the the image of the fish, it's, I'm about to do right here on this side of the paper, and I'll slide this over. And doing it in a different medium, hopefully, because I'm going to paint it, and it's not going to be as crisp and nice lines as the the pencil crayon. And I've really tried to build. No, there's no. I don't use black a lot of times when I'm using pencil crayon because I like to build up a black. So any any dark values that you see in here is actually uh, browns and blues. Oh, I think uh, we got another. Paul Pete is joining us. Hi, Paul. Howdy. Uh, so I'm just finishing this little bit of this off. And then uh, in two shakes of a lamb's tail, I know that's a bad reference. Anyways, I'm about to lay out the other fish, but I just wanted to finish this little bit. And I kind of like the fact, now this is another thing about, you know, the considerations we make along the way in our process. I kind of like the fact that there's a softness to um, the lines and softness to the values in the pencil crayon images that I've done. I don't need them to be too, um, too dark and too, too opaque by any means, because for me, that is just one more way I want to differentiate foreground image from background image. So, um, just, you know, you got to play with things. You got to have fun with things. The, I had a lot of fun this morning in the page that I did about uh, like a bolt of uh, strikes like a bolt of lightning. I, I keep having to look up the title. Um, I had a lot of fun with that because I really wanted to shake up dialogue boxes. I really wanted to shake up background information. I wanted to incorporate. Oh, Andy Wheatley's joined us. Hey, Andy, how you doing? Whoops, where did I go? There we are. Afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us, Andy. So one of the things that I did on the page that I did this morning was to push those things and to incorporate 
uh, these visual elements together and which was a really rather chaotic and, and intense way, but I wanted to do it by using that color, that, that cream value to really punch that out. And so when I did this this morning, I'll pull it up for a second. So when I did this, I, I did all kinds of silly, fun things on layers. So if I take out the flat background, you can see how the lightning bolt stands over top of the image, you know, and yet the art, it's all after, these are all effects that I put down. Little things like trying to, there's the title out now. So this is just the effects layer, but even this text, uh, balloon, is it still a balloon? Uh, it goes underneath the effects so that uh, you can really see that crisp, clean boom. And hopefully that makes it a little more intense and push. And so this is all the sort of, this is the play part. This is the playing after the fact. So, you know, um, yeah, having fun. So, okay, so this is pretty much laid out for the fish now. And uh, what I really don't have any in here is any any of that orange. And I try to come in at the end with the let's use orange to simulate the flesh tone. But hold off on that because it can quickly overpower if you use that as a flesh tone too fast and too soon, it can quickly overpower the uh, the colors that you're building up in order to make somebody's skin. So I'll come in with those those reds and those oranges at the very end. So, but um, yeah, had a lot of fun doing this. So we're just going to put some dots on here for fish, and then we're onto the watercolor. But I'm going to draw the fish in. To, uh, to paint over in the watercolor with this same orange pencil crayon. So I'm going to get my, this is the colors that I've used, if anybody's interested. Chris, Andy is another Beale Art alumni from the late 80s. Hey, super cool. Right on, good stuff, buddy. Beale Art, it's uh, one of those experiences that we're not going to have, uh, I don't know if it's the same. I don't know if it's the same today, but I hope so. I hope so. I know a lot of people that are teaching there now, and I, I really hope so for the kids because I think the experience of Beale Art is immeasurable for me. I spent a lot of my time in the art library, which is, if anybody that, that went to our art school, it was a closet. So um, anyways, those are the colors that I used. And uh, we're going to try some fun things. Like I got this crazy woolen texture. I'm going to punch into the, the watercolor today because... Uh, because you know just for scuzz so and then the watercolors that i'll be using is the uh the standard tray that i of colors that i normally use that i got at a a bookstore in uh in a small cottage town here in ontario so okay so the last little gym jam that i'm going to do here before i get into drawing our fish in is uh is to put these dots in on on the uh, on the fish. So uh, just give me a quick brief second, and we'll. The reason that I'm using this paint to do this is so that uh, I can uh, not have to go over. Wow, that's really intense. Come on, sponge. Well, that thing soaks up all the attention. Anyways. Is that better? Yeah, that's happier. Okay, so I'm just throwing in these little dots and, and, and skin patterns that these, these fish have and just throwing them in over top of the, the color so they, they punch up and they give it a little more body. So I don't know. Um, I'm having a lot of fun right now. I'm feeling really productive. And I'm really enjoying um, the opportunity to get stuff done. If anybody, in case anybody that might pop in today doesn't know, uh, I'm going to be doing a evening 
live stream tomorrow night with Jim Lu on. And I'm really looking forward to that. I really appreciate what Jim does and uh, his work. And so I'm really lo excited and looking forward to talking to him about process and uh, perspective on uh, why we do this thing that we do. And uh, I hope people tune in and watch it. It'll be here on the the old streaming. You're being disagreeable, paint pen. So this is an acrylic paint marker that I'm using. Just because it puts a solid, solid amount of value down. But I don't know if it's really showing up on there, but you get the gist of it. So just running these dots through the old fisher rooney and then uh, let's paint some fish. So I've got a question of the day that I've put up. Uh, oh, yeah, that's that's so true, Andy. So true. It was a great place to create and learn. Uh, so I've got a question of the day that I've put up, uh, which is a question I put up every day. If you've got a one page comic idea for me to do that, you can sum up in one or two sentences. Let me know. I don't want uh, scripts and I don't want uh, corporate characters. But uh, let me know if you got an idea to explore. And then we've done things like um, trying to think of the examples that I usually use. Uh, Nic uh, Nicholas Cage giving the COVID addresses the Queen. Uh, Antonio Banderas is too sexy. Frankenstein monster goes to kindergarten. A war between oatmeal and chocolate chip cookies at the teacup. You know, there's all kinds of mad and crazy and fun ideas that uh, it's just fun to chase down and chase after. Uh, roving horde of vegan zombies. That was one I really got a kick out of. And... Uh, a lot of these are collected in uh, one page comic extravaganza volume one. Uh, and we are now, well, I think this is 19. This is page 19 for volume two. In volume two, I'm doing in, uh, in this landscape format. So. All right, so I am going to shift this along and bring this in a little clip it Rooney there. So you can still see the, the UFO drag racing. <laughs> I got to write that down. That's good. I like that. See, that's the jam. That's the whole point, folks. Uh, if anybody's in the uh, UFO drag racing, salty snacks. All right, yeah, let's uh, we'll get cracking at that this week. Good, good stuff, buddy. All right, um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, let me put the announcement up for for Jim. This is uh, this is the Deets if anybody needs him. But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to like you can see with his work and how he progresses, movement and his characters and his uh his animations and uh, I just, I like that line. I like that style. I like that energy in there. And I'm really keen to chatting with him about, uh, about how he goes about making his, uh, his work. So, okay. Uh, yeah. So now we're on to, I want to do this next part in watercolor because uh, I do. There's no, deeper reasoning behind me for 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 why i go about doing that i mean the thing about some some processes uh, are really controlled and the thing about other processes are really chaotic uh and i like that but trying to fuse those different things together for me kind of gives a liberation to how how i go about processing 
you know, how I go about processing that image and how I go about, go about processing that language. So, you know, you got to do what you do. All right. Um, yeah, I found some fun pictures of fish, which is a really random thing to say. So I'm just looking for some inspirato. Anybody that says that they don't use source, you got to give yourself a chance there. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with playing with source. There's absolutely nothing wrong with taking uh, some degree of imagery and allowing yourself to to use that opportunity to explore, you know, your your narrative and your. <laughs> okay, hold on. I just all right. Ah, oh, here we go. We're hot to trot. Christ Christopher Walken ordering a beer, drinking it. Yeah, okay. All right, writing it down. Christopher Walken ordering a beer and drinking it. Drinking it? Yeah. And that's Andy Wheatley. All right. Well, what day is it today? <laughs> um, today is Monday. Uh, I'll post this tomorrow, and uh, we'll do UFO drag racing tomorrow. And then uh, we'll do uh, Christopher Walken on Wednesday. So this is our Tuesday page, and this is our Wednesday page. And so if anybody comes up with anything else in the interim, let me know. We'll get them written down, and we'll... We've got our week scheduled for one page comics. Um, I've got a couple other things that uh, I've also got cooking on the side. Um, let me see. This is uh, the next page I got cooking on the side. Here is this piece about dragons. So that's uh, that's on the back burner. I'll uh, I'll get to those after we get through some of this these one page suggestions because to me that's more fun. I'll, uh, I'm gonna I'm going to uh, to draw whatever I'm going to draw anyways so why not why not chase down the ideas that other people give me first to me that's a lot more fun so uh, UFO drag racing is Tuesdays and thank you very much uh, Melton or salty and uh, Christopher Watkins ordering a beer and drinking it is Wednesday thank you very much Andy all right. So, uh, so I've got some, and again, this is the other beautiful thing about working mix. I got to switch this paper around now. Is that uh, in working on cardstock, I prefer cardstock over. I know a lot of people that are still uh, trying to do stuff and draw stuff at home. You can get a thing of fifty pages of cardstock for ten dollars Canadian. So I don't know how much that is American. Now it's not a hundred sheets of 20 to 50 pages cardstock is ten, about $10 Canadian, depending on the quality and the thickness of it, at most office supply stores. My wife and I were going around cost costing some things out just, just because uh, we found a uh, couple things at different stores that were clearly different values. And, uh, and that's a smart thing to do when you're buying your supplies is to just sort of figure out where you can find it for better value. And uh, if you're gonna buy typewriter paper to work on, realize that working on your typewriter paper is great. It has the availability for you to start telling some stories, but what it also has is a limit to how much you can push and how much you can mark and how much you can throw at it and layer it with and how wet it can get. So. If you have the available opportunity to, to sit down and grade yourself up to some kind of cardstock, and in addition to that, you know, you can get colored cardstock, you can get, uh, you know, you can get uh, textured. It looks like it's textured, like fake parchment paper or whatever. Now you can do that for paper too. But again, looking at it as a cardstock, it allows you to 
pursue different avenues that you might not have considered because of its rigidity, because of its, its, its ability to take a little bit of abuse here. And so I really got to advocate that for folks to give it a try. We all have different methods of working and in our different methods of working and what this, so today's topic really is the way to understand your artistic self. And what I'm referring to in that is the less that you allow yourself to leave your comfort zone, the less that you um, restrain yourself from the available opportunity and option of pursuing things that you might not normally do, you're, you're not going to really kind of figure out who you are in your gut and what it is that you can truly do. And the reason for that, a little more light going to help. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, you haven't really enabled yourself to go for the gusto. And while, you know, cardstock isn't the answer to the universe, what it is, however, is just one more way that you can push that boundary and one more way that you can allow yourself to just chase after exploration and and trying different medium out and really sort of i don't know how to express it anymore than just swing for the fences and give it a thought give it a, a, an opportunity I, I i don't want to ever express to anybody to go out and spend x amount of dollars because Let's be honest, things cost enough as it is. And at the same time, I don't want to impede anybody's progress on the way that they're working or the progress that they're making. But if there's a part of you that starts feeling limited, if there's a part of you that starts feeling held back because of the fact that you're, uh, you've been you know, working one specific way for a time, try that. That might be some fun. It's a lousy eraser I just used. Is this one just as bad? Yeah, cares. That's why I generally try not to erase. All right, so uh, here's the first fish that I've laid down. Who knows? I mean, maybe you try something new in that new format of, of, of Surface to work on that is going to just kick it open in your head. And then suddenly, oh, ho, ho, now that I've given myself just a moment's approach, it's going to allow me to really try something different here. I mean, that's the thing is that we'll never know unless we, we go for that, we swing for that. So. Now, I, I'm hard to talk about it because I'm kind of unrestrained crazy, but okay, that's enough lines. I'm going to find the rest of it with color. Uh, so my theory is this. I'm going to do a couple of fish, and then we're going to go into Photoshop and really lay them on top of each other. But let's to start things off, I want to... Um, just throw a couple of fish on the, on the, the page and we'll paint those up and then off we go, off to the races. So I've got just a, an image, a small, I have a small little Kindle beside my drawing board on my desk and uh, I've got uh, a picture <laughs> that's big. Of, of the fish that I'm trying to do. And uh, and so once I get them laid down, and once I principally put down some value on them, uh, I'm going to throw the my resource away, as, as I usually advocate. And the reason for that is that once I got the idea there, uh, then it becomes more so about finding the image and finding the... Uh,
finding the values, finding the find the, the colors I want, finding the the way that I'm going to interpret my my line. And if I'm just trying to replicate a photograph, I'm not going to evaluate enough how I'm putting down colors and how colors are working together. So that's why any time that I'm sourcing an image to work from, once you put it down, once you get the gist of it there, get rid of it. Get rid of it. There's no fa hard, fast rules. If you go to a show with your work in it and somebody walks up to you and says, that's not how that's actually supposed to look, kick that person out of your show. <laughs> because, oh, I think they're looking for a photography exhibit. So there's a couple different breeds of the same fish, I think. I don't know. I just looked up Canadian fish. This is one of the images that, was, that were there. Good enough. Let's go. Now, the stamping thing that I did on uh, Sunday, and if you're ever curious about some of the different approaches and different materials that I use, feel free to look at previous videos and, and, hey, and sign up for our YouTube channel so you get notified whenever this lunatic is doing this, which is just every day at 2 o'clock. But, um, but you can look up previous YouTube videos and you'll see different mark-making medium that I'll... I'll throw at stuff and and different uh, mixed materials. Uh, what do we got? Somebody said something. I'm sorry, I saw it. Uh, I agree. Just recreating a reference might be technically impressive, but is isn't artistically interesting. Exactly, exactly, Gary. It's it's not. It's uh, it's why we invented uh, cameras and photocopiers. Now that's I think that, and here we go. Chris is going to pick a fight. I think that's why there's a great difference between um, graphic design approaches and fine art, visual artist type approaches in, in how we execute uh, images. Because one is to try to really sell that established image and the other one is to Let's just see where it goes and to really push that. Uh, just give me a second. My uh, clip has come undone. That's why my page keeps shifting. All right. Happy, 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 joy, joy. Okay. So, um, so this is the. Yeah, Gary, that was a really good insight. That's a really, really powerful insight to say that, uh, you know, it's it makes it more visually interesting, the stamp that you put on it. And that's the stamp I want to see from people. I mean, that's why I'm looking at whoever's work is because I want to see how they're speaking towards something. I want to see how they are saying whatever they're saying with their mark-making material. And, and I think that that's the thing that separates the herd, you know, the, the wheat from the chafe, the, the strong from the, the, I don't know what the hell, you know, the analogy, metaphor, whatever the hell I'm trying to make, um, is that uh, you have the affordance to, to sing with your own voice. Okay, so I'm really excited about this. The water, the water uh, brushes that they've been selling now, they're now putting out flat brushes in those. Oh, Nelly, Christopher, very, very excited because it lets you just, you know, try some different things. And that's, that's, man, that's compelling. You know, nice big flat things, really hard to do when you were just using these pointed brushes. Yeah, that's the stuff I look for in shows is, uh, I was at an exhibition recently and it was uh, almost photographic images, paintings of, of people. Technically, ah, cool. But uh, I, I don't know. It just, they 
there just seemed to be an artificiality to it because of, uh, you know, it was so realistic to the, uh, to the extent that, you know, it doesn't say anything. It's just portrait work. Not that every piece has to say something, but it sure is. It sure is fun when they do. It says push. What kind of a society do we live in when it, a brush that is you're supposed to squeeze water out of into the bristles in order to use actually has to say push on it? Now, I understand public toilets have to say flush <laughs> because some people just don't know that. Oh, that's how that works. That's very different than my hole in the floor. Uh, today's, uh, I'm listening to The King of Limbs. Radiohead. I was just listening to Swordfish Trombone by Tom Waits. Because if you've noticed, I like complicated, weird music. So I'm just throwing down some shapes. And uh, and then we're going to, that's about enough of that. Now we're going to jump over to the next guy and uh, play with some of his shapes here and do the same, do the same thing. Now these lines came down so late that maybe they didn't pick up on camera. So we'll try this a little bit. Put these uh, these colors down to see if that helps. So it's a mixed result, this little brush here, because uh, I don't think that the bristles hold very well. They really don't. I mean, it's like it has to have uh, I don't think that they'll last very long is what I'm saying. Fish, there's something fishy. Something fishy about these pictures. All right, good enough. I'm putting away the reference. There we go. Boom, 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 boom. So I tend to have a cloth beside me and uh, squeeze the pigment as much as I can out of these brushes. These brushes stain really fast, but I try to get as much pigment out of them as I can so that, uh, you know. <laughs> Okay, I just joined. Recap everything that was said for me. Yeah. If only I could. I talked about my feelings. I talked about the government hates us so much. Um, I think we just talked about we got some great one-page comic ideas for this week. UFO drag racing. For Tuesday and Christopher Walker ordering a beer and drinking it for Wednesday. So that was fun. Um, we just talked about not limiting ourselves creatively. So one method I think that can help some people is uh, consider uh, changing the surface you're working on. Uh, this is purple. I'm sorry, violet. The Violet Hour. So I've got uh, a round head brush with the tip, of course. And uh, I'm just pulling up some, some paint on there and chopping in some hits with the brush. I'm not looking at it as lines. I'm looking at these hits as colors 
and uh, not overly concerned about everything being perfect and 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 beautiful. It's just uh, let's get some some information dance for us to build on. You know, let's look at that up. Sorry, Chip. So yeah, so maybe 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 um, working on uh, cardstock, working on a heavier grade paper than we initially are starting ourselves out with. Because most people, I think, here started on newsprint or uh, or typewriter paper, and uh, and so if we afford ourselves the opportunity to try something like a heavier grade paper and see how that lets us jim jam mixed materials together because it does have a little bit more ability to take some some hits to hit, take some water to take some to take some marks in there that might be something that'll afford people the opportunity to to try to explore a little more eliminate some of the restraint <laughs> excellent excellent my favorite gary hodges album has to be uh gary hodges sings the golden oldies i mean sure some of that material these days is uh questionable at best gary but you know the voice ha huh? melts you you know what i mean you put that on Huh? You put that on in your own personal environment when you're trying to uh, trying to impress a lady with your grilled cheese sandwich abilities. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, at one point she'll say to you, "What are we listening to?" That's right, the Jim Luhan, the one that jumped out of those school buses on that moped. Well, okay, he mostly drove over them, but that Jim Luhan. All right, so I keep a... <laughs> getting weird with Chris. I keep a hairdryer beside my, beside my desk in my studio so that when I'm working in it and when i'm putting some some uh some paint down on a surface uh i got impatient for for it to dry or for it to get to the point that i want it to be for me to keep working and so oftentimes i will uh i will kick that sucker out so i'll be doing that at least once during this trying a different uh some different approaches here to this one Trying to make each fish unique. This one's name is Larry, and the other one's name is George. <laughs> excellent, excellent. My favorite Gary Hodges album was simply Gary, the one with the cover with Gary in a canoe with a guitar and soft focus. I, uh, it's kind of like uh, my love of the album uh, um, about Phil Chandler sings the blues and it's got him walking down the street with that guitar, you know, over his shoulder and he's doing that sort of Chet Atkins look. He just, uh, he just chose to do it with his bum hanging out. So that's, you know, that's a great cover. I, I, I would hope it and pray on some level that somebody someday watches one of these live streams of us saying stuff like this and desperately tries to look up those albums. <laughs> Jim, you know, Jim Luhan, who's it? Is this an I musician? <laughs> 
Secret recipes. Secret recipes at this point. Uh, I don't tend to think uh, too much while I'm while I'm putting colors in. Uh, I tend to just kind of go with what feels right as I'm doing it, and uh, I kind of find that I get some fun combinations doing it that way. So I don't know necessarily that my mixing of values is uh, makes any rhyme or reason, but for me it does. Just because I do it by the feels, you know, the feels. And that's part of the whole process of us exploring the mark making that we're doing and and, and making pictures and making images is that we're trying to find and discover things that, uh, you know, as a means of communication, as a means of looking at the world. And that's the whole, that's part of the shtick. That's part of the finding your artistic self, like figuring out, you know, what is it that, that I want to pursue? What is it that I want to evaluate and see what uh, I have to say? You know, you come into, especially things with like storytelling, we'll come into comics with, well, this is, I want to have some social messages or I want to do some funny books or, you know, nonstop fart gags or uh, pinup books or, or sci-fi or whatever our intention is with how we're we're coming at our projects or coming at our interpretations of what it is that we want to do. But I think that over time you find that uh, that might not be who you are and what you're doing. You might find that that voice that starts coming out, that song you start singing while you're working is a whole different melody. It's a whole different thing. And I think that happens from the being unencumbered and the just going for it part. Maybe. Maybe um, it's and it's. I'm curious to hear other people's takes on that. Is it? Uh, is there benefit to that? Is there benefit to to chasing things out there? To going out and trying a different different medium or different different approach or or working outside your comfort zone on subject matter or trying to draw with things you don't normally do, trying to draw things you don't normally do. And uh, has anybody ever found in their process that that is something that has helped them to a little more clearly understand some of the things that they're trying to do or they're trying to say because approaching those different things told them different, diff, uh, you know, something, something new and fresh and interesting about themselves and how they're working and maybe what their work has to say. So if anybody has any perspective on that, I'd love to hear it. But, uh, and if so, how did you come to that? How did you come to that, uh, to that evaluation or that realization in, in from your evaluation as well? Because maybe that's something that'll help others. In fact, I know that stuff like that helps other people. I know that. What have I got here? There's certain colors that I kind of go to in projects that I'm doing just because I like those colors. And uh, that's another way that uh, you can see a sort of uniformity and rather divergent work from people because there's a uniformity in the colors that they use or, you know, not just the tools, but specific colors or specific marks or like I, I'm at the point now where I have to restrain myself <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm working in any, in any uh, medium to try to stick with that medium <laughs> because 
but just there's go-to things that we do that we kind of enjoy. And at the same time, there is uh, things that, hey, I'll just do this. I'll try this out. And well, you just maybe try to stick with that thing. So I'll, that's the challenge I'll set for myself is if I'm going to do this in pencil part and pencil crayon and this part in watercolor, should I have to stick to the watercolor? Or should I have to stick to the pencil crayon? Uh, I'll be, I'm going to let, spoiler alert, I tend not to stick with it. Has anybody ever started on a project and dropped it as well because it was working their way? Oh, hold on. Somebody's got something to say. Uh, oh, hold on. Sorry. Too fast for me. There we go. One thing that's been interesting about working on DBSM is when I started, I felt it was about one thing. But as the years have gone by and I reread them, I realized it's about other things too that I hadn't really, really realized or intended. That's exciting. That's really exciting. That's uh, thank you for sharing that because that's uh, that's a pretty fantastic thing. That you know, if it's a if it's a message, it's one thing. If it's a if it's stylistically, it's another. But when you start your your process and you start your book, the person that you are when you started that project is not who you are now by any means by any means and because of that you can't help but that happen you can't help especially if it's a project that's going to take x amount of time uh, uh, uh no, the more prolonged the time the more the subjective change is going to happen in the dialogue of it because no matter how old you are and no matter how self-defined you are and uh you know your your emotional your mental your your uh your maturity in general, you are going to subjectively change over time. That's, I hope so. I really do. I hope that for people because it's just the growth, subjective growth of, of a person. And how could you say the same thing? How could you, you know, how could you uh, have the same message over time? And then you might even not consciously realize like, I, you know, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, so Gary, correct me on this, but you might have thought you were saying A, but you were subversively to yourself even saying B because that was really on your mind in some conscious or subconscious way. It's hard too, right? Like not everybody sets out to be radical and not everybody sets out to be controversial i think the people that specifically do so it, it it always comes off as hollow you know as avant-garde as people might think that they're being it does show through as conventional so this is an olive green i'm using this has got to be my favorite color So depending on the pressure I put on this little brush and the amount, of course, of pigment that's on it is where that line comes from, the hardness or softness of a line. It makes a value here. Yeah, I'm not going to end up sticking to just uh, watercolor here. It's, uh... Trying 
trying to think about how the fish is shaped and how these these planes of its form move around the, the body of the fish and how light moves around that so the tone of those fish the fish will change try to think about the object or the person or the animal or whatever it is that I'm working on is actually specifically shaped that's something that tends to be in my old noggin as I'm going with whatever level of result and I like the idea of colors over colors and and how they'll I was uh, I had a painting teacher named Brian Fry when I was uh, uh, BL Art, the school I went to out of high school that uh, I learned uh, the foundational stuff of my art schmazel. And uh, Brian Fry's abstract paintings uh, would be color field studies of layers and layers and layers of watercolor really really uh thin layers over top of each other over top of each other over top of each other in order to make more combative colors and uh i just when i looked at it when i was a young guy i thought you know initially as every young person does at first you look at it and go jesus that sounds like an exercise of madness but uh the realization of course is that here's a person who's really exploring color and light how uh how all of that comes together and uh, you know you get it more and more as you get older but uh yeah i really like that about what uh what brian had to do you know and so in the course of a term as i as i tried painting techniques and learned those from him i realized how complicated and how complex it was that he was doing and it's funny those things that uh we pick up over time and we pick up for our, from our own approaches and experience. And that's again, you know, on that journey for self-discovery and self-exploration and defining of ourselves creatively and, and, and individually as people. But it's, uh, it's those moments. It's those things that, uh, that might be out of our wheelhouse or our perspective completely for how we would associate one goes about painting and just this is blue put big big slabs of blue on it with acrylic paint and then you've got a person who works largely with you know the complexity of watercolor beside you who does like the most thin and finely applied thing and, and how does that change how does that change your your perspective on on how you're associating painting and how you're associating color and value. I got a hot ear. So yeah, those are those are sort of things that you know your your headspace will change over time. And the more that you allow yourself the opportunity to try to ex explore those and to try to implement those different uh those different approaches and how you work, you know, that's what an opportunity that is. I think the only real challenge, I'm going to say something right now, but the only real challenge I find with these water brush pens is that it's really challenging to do really thin washes unless you smudge it. I don't, hold on, I'll move this over. Unless you squish out a whole bunch of color someplace to the side so that you can thin down the amount of pigment that you've picked up with your brush. That's the only way for you to put down thinner glazes or because I'm sure you could try to squeeze it as you as you drag the the brush across, but it's not going to be the same thing. And that's that's the big tricky part of these suckers that might be uh, limiting for some. Or an opportunity. So I've clearly got 
palettes, like tonal palettes for each of these fish that I'm that I'm throwing down, but there are unifying colors that I'm putting through both. And uh, it's funny how red, like a light apl application of red in the the top fish is so much different in the bottom. This is the same thing like when I'm doing the pencil crayon drawing, like I've got over here. Hold on. Like when I'm doing a pencil, yeah, when I'm doing the pencil crayon drawing, I'm starting with a, a soft value, whether it's a, a yellow like over here, or it's a really light green like over here, and I'll just lay out the composition in a really soft way and then it just becomes a case of building up building up building up building up building up and throwing down those different val uh, values it'd be curious to me especially in like gary's example if when we look back on our older work and do we see is it we do we see a different thing being said than maybe we thought we were saying or are we looking at what we were saying before filtered through today's perspective? I'm wondering how often that, that might be a, a situation. All right, I'm going to give that a second. I'm going to get the old... Uh, Air blower out here for a second, so apologize me for the uh, from apologies from me for the noise. But I gotta dry down my watercolor. One second, please. I gotta plug in my air dryer. As soon as uh, you notice that I just brushed my hand over here and flicked off a little bit of fibers from the, the paper. As soon as you see that in whatever surface, it, whatever paper you're working on, you got two choices. You can either stomp and let it dry or force it to dry. Or uh, you can realize that you're about to destabilize the surface of your paper. And you can work with that or not, right? Because there is there's a workability in that as well. Doesn't take much. All right. So I'm going down to a smaller tip and I'm going to start throwing in some some hash marks now, a little more definition here. Um, I got to figure out a way for, because sometimes people want to see how I'm going about mixing whatever, um, as I've been told this. So uh, there's no real sophisticated blending technique that I'm using here. It's looking at the different colors in my palette and pulling up some of this and pulling up some of that and in the same brush. And so off times I'll be cleaning up my palette to, to make sure that uh, I haven't polluted all of those values too much. So this is a finer, finer head on this brush than the last, which lets me get into some smaller marks, which I kind of like. I'm still controlling and containing the amount of pigment that's on the brushes I'm making these marks, but I'm exploring it and uh, how that interacts with the, uh, the values that I already have down. This is a red that I'm using right now and coming in over the green, of course, if people pull out their color wheels, 
and realize that how the red and the green work together changes a lot in your surface of your image. Uh, sorry, I had to run out for 10 minutes. Well, we missed you. Uh, oh, what is that? Whenever I use my hair dryer on my iPad, it really messes things up. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. It happens to the best of us. It's not doing anything. I think my hair dryer was broken. Nope. Nope. My screen's broken. Chris said that you're supposed to use it. Thanks a lot, Chris. So I'm just making some marks. Let's, uh... My wife gets mad at me using her hair dryer. Uh, this was a whole thing in my house um, because I still can't get the white off my screen. <laughs> Um, this is a whole thing in my house about the hair dryer is that, uh, as I was sort of really finally, finally putting together my studio space here, uh, in the basement and so allow myself the free, uh, ability to, to access all the different medium that I want to use and, and all the different, uh, approaches that I want to use. I realized I no longer have a palm dryer. And so uh, I asked uh, my wife if she has a, a hair dryer I can use. And uh, she said, why? Which is a great way to, you know, great response. But um, uh, she had this gigantic one that I'm using in the closet because she just, you know, she doesn't use it. And here I am thinking uh, she might have some sort of small thing and 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 cute and 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 easily you know easily transportable she gives me this gigantic hair dryer which is really handy i really uh got a lot of use out of it and i'm really appreciative of her doing that but it wasn't what i expected for some reason i thought she was going to give me a tiny hair dryer but yeah don't use your wife's or if you do get permission All right, so putting in some of those lines, defining some uh, some shape and form, this fat cat. Handy. It's handy. Now I'm going to go into a magenta color, which is like a transitional color between um, red and purple. And uh, I'm going to start having some fun putting down some marks on this guy with the magenta. Define some shape a little more and uh, putting in some colors and some values that just sort of get a little bit more depth. You know, that's the sort of uh, that's the thing, even even as it's, uh, you know, I don't generally use watercolor in a traditional way on a regular basis. I always use it as uh, throwing down some, some base tone onto a drawing or, or into a painting or something, or a mixed media image, or I'll, uh, I, t I tend to just use it as a, a sort of a punchy thing as opposed to it just the elegance that watercolor offers us of building up color and value. And so for me to just have, sort of have to stick with it, I, I tend to still use it like uh, I'm half drawing with it really. Because when, even when I put color down in, into different uh, mixed media projects, I, I, I look at it as shapes just just hits just hits a value which is more of a i think that's more of a thing that you do with uh acrylic and or oil or or more opaque painting 
so I might my application might be wrong in that in a traditional sense, but it's working for me. So I thought I'd remind everybody again about tomorrow. I'm going to do this regularly because I'm really excited. Uh, tomorrow night, 9 o'clock EST, 7 o'clock MST, 6 o'clock PST. Jim Lujan. I'm going to do a nighttime stream, which I don't do very often. And uh, Jim Lujan and I are going to talk art. We're going to talk about some stuff. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. So if you're able to, please come on out. You got some thoughts and some ideas or some, some things you want to talk about? Jim has a fantastic body of work and a fantastic style that he creates his own works from. And so I'm sure he's got some pretty great insights. In this adventure, we're all on of making waffles. Whatever it is we're doing. So the next thing I'm going to do is, according to the sketch that, what's, uh, what did I miss? Oh, I'm right on. That's fantastic. Love it to hear it, Jim. Looking forward to night, Chris. Night, Chris is where I uh, I bring out a smoking jacket, and uh, and I talk in a really deep and Salty, salty voice that, you know, drives all of the otters and other various forest creatures crazy. I've got all kinds of questions in mind for Jim. Like, why do you do what you do? You know, really intense stuff. It's going to be great. There's nothing like the old fallback, the old standby. Why? Right? That's the best. That's the best question you can ask anybody. We had a, a fun episode uh, at that in one of the live streams recently where uh, Gary uh, Hodges joined me. And we talked about, uh, why do you do what you do? It was fun. I was trying desperately to think of a way that I could do a fun introduction for for Jim and his work and try to figure out some quick little animated thing, but I, I don't know how to to animate, so unfortunately uh, I'm, I'm falling short on that. Maybe, <laughs> where do you get your ideas from? That's a great question. <laughs> Why? Why? Or my favorite my favorite question, if anybody has any questions they want to know, let me know. But my favorite question to ask people is, what did you do? So, why did you do that? I got to stop this. Jim's not going to come. <laughs> I ain't going on this, this live stream with this guy. He got crazy. All right, so this is me just having fun moving these marks around the surface, and I don't know how well it's turning out in the camera, but some some of these little, I'll adjust the direction of these little hashes of, of lines that I'm putting down as it moves around the fish, and I'm putting them in really lightly so that it uh, just gets us around that body. And I'm using magenta in both of these, uh, both of these fish. So, you know, it's fun. Very different types of fish for for color and very different types of. Uh, is it the right way to do it? Is there better ways to go about it? Yeah, probably. In fact, I'm pretty sure there are, but. I was at a 
exhibition uh, when I released uh, my last book. It was uh, an exhibition through this gallery in a, a mall setting where I'm doing signings and other people are trying to sell watercolors. And it was one of those mixed things. And beside me was uh, a couple of ladies and they were talking about purity, <laughs> purity. And I'm a purist when it comes to how I work. And, uh, and what they were referring to was uh, you got to have a specific quality of material. You got to have a specific, you know, um, degree of, of uh, traditional approach to how you go about making something. And basically the whole talk was uh, between the two of them was that there's a, a, this proper way to do to do watercolors and yeah i don't know i don't work that way so here comes the white gesso paint so this is just coming in and just throwing in some little rando hits Just because, just per guys, I for some reason I like coming in postscript and and putting a, a couple of little belts. There's a I've I've talked about this uh, artist before, and I will talk about this artist until my lips fall off. There's a a painter and uh, an artist named Baron Story is. Uh, it was your animation huckleberry the huckleberry hound um there's a there was a an artist named baron story and still is i believe he's still with us it's uh I, i'm sorry i'm not one that keeps up to date on who's here and who isn't anymore uh, but uh baron story uh taught at a number of different schools in the united states and one of the things that he talked about in his his address to students was uh, don't be afraid to put down and then take away put down and then take away you know uh, put down some color and some lines and some value and and he has all kinds of different examples in traditional medium that some of them are not the most healthy ways to go about it but he talked about the idea that um, you can Put down your image put down your painting and then go about right afterwards and this is a sucky brush and uh cover it up with like a uh, sort of a spray fix or a workable fix or something like that and then go over it and take out some of that like go over it with white or go over it with some base value and paint right over what you just did and I think it's I think it's absolutely fantastic to to look at to look at things that way. It sort of takes the preciousness out of it and allows the idea that uh, I'm going to go back in and, and and make a mess out of the the notion that I had. Maybe it's just this. Bear with me a second. Picking a fight with some color here now. Try this kid. This is a uh, I made the leap from watercolor to ink already. Just because I want a more solid punch of white. There we go. Ink is fairly unforgiving. I find that watercolor can be worked a little easier. And but ink is just here I am. Does anybody else's pieces talk to him like that? Anyways, uh, look up story. There's a comic that came out by Vanguard Publishing, if you're really rooted in comic world. Uh, 
It's uh, the 1995-96 watch manual, or watch annual, I'm sorry. And inside that is like nine pages of notes that Baron Story would give to his his fine art students in uh, in college and say, here's all the stuff that you can, here's all the stuff that you can just, you know, beat up. And you got a whole thing about Phil being uh, animation Huckleberry. Huckleberry? I don't think I've ever done that. You being the Huckleberry. <laughs> I think we're trying to figure out what the Huckleberry reference is. Is that uh, is that a doc? Uh, is that what's that? What's that character's name from Wild Earp? Doc, Doc, uh, his friend there, played by Dennis Quaid, possibly Dennis Quaid's best role, by the way, or is it Val Camera? I can't remember which one. There's one for one film and one for another, but I think it's a Dennis Quaid one in the Wild Earp, uh, as by Ke Kevin Costner. Whatever it was, whichever one Dennis Quaid played, he was pretty impressive. So, Doc Holiday, thank you, Gary. <laughs> Doc, Doc, it was Doc, Doc. Uh, there's an alternative meaning. There we are. But he says that line there when they're going to go face off against all these cowboys. And uh, you're with us, Doc. And he says, I'll be your Huckleberry. And he is a. Not just a good gambler, but he was a lethal shootist. So this is just giving a little more of that definition to these these areas and these lines and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, not getting too overly concerned about it. So this, so what I'm again the intention of this and these different uh, approaches that I've taken, and I'll I'll suss this up in just one second, so that. Uh, I can show you my intent because I'm not going to be sitting here and boring you senseless by doing it all on the Photoshop. -y. Well, uh, you know, you've already watched me making a mess because I still got to scan them and then, 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 right. But the intention is to take these fish and I've, I've drawn it out here in this, this small, tiny little image. Uh, what are you saying, Salty? You like you like uh, in that context, it is the willing executor of some commission. There we go. Love that language. Um, Val Kilner. I think a gauntlet just got thrown. I think uh, Salty is saying that they prefer Val Kilmer. I, uh, is which one was Kilmer in? Is Kilmer in the Kevin Costner? I just remember, uh, Dennis Quaid doing the uh, his his uh version of it. He looked horrible, which is the idea, and I was just really impressed by that. Oh, it was it was Val Kilmer that said, "I'll be I'm your Huckleberry." Okay. Well, I've, I've attributed the quote to the wrong guy, but uh, it's the it's the right character. Yes, Corbin. Just sit down. What would a live stream be without me arguing with a cat? Huh? Gary was doing his live stream on Saturday, and I, I jumped in to join in a conversation for a second there, and, and I uh, exposed Gary to the sheer chaos of my <laughs> situation at times. Uh, it's also Kerm Kilmer was with Kurt Russell and Tombstone. Quaid was with Costner and Wyatt Earp. Yeah, it was Quaid that blew me away in Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp! And because there's uh, the way he said Wyatt Earp was just disgusting. It was very phlegmy. Uh, it was an old turn of phrase in the 1800s, which would uh, make sense. It was used in the movie. Yeah. Fantastic. There's certain uh, certain 
portrayals in certain films that uh, actors just, it's a real departure for them. And I think that Dennis Quaid in Wild Earp is a absolute brilliant performance on his part. Shaky, 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 shaky. Here we go. All right. So the intention is as follows. And I might do a couple more little hits there up the white. But in the meantime, let's just walk through this. So my intention is, and the working process that I'm going to apply here is that uh, I'm going to take these different elements at this point. And I've got very small, a little sketch here of the composition. As I, what have, what have I missed? Everyone talks about Kilmer's holiday, but Quaid's is also great. I, I just, for some reason, it's Quaid for me because he just, its he's a sack of garbage in that. And like he really, it's an actor really defacing themselves and to, for the role because that's what the character that they're portraying is. And I think that's why Quaid really stands up. I'm not saying uh, Val Kilmer doesn't do an excellent job because he does. But for me, it's that, the way he says, what? <laughs> I mean, it's so bad that he, it's even commented on in the film. Okay, so this is a composition that I've laid out. It's called Fishtailing. And this piece, in order to differentiate it from previous pages, I'm going to put the text at the bottom. So if you flip through my Instagram or my uh, Facebook post that I put out, or, or on Patreon, if you're on one of my Patreon people, um, there's... Uh, a general approach that we put where we put the title on the left side of the page or on the top of the page. I try to shift it around if I can, uh, because is it absolutely necessary that the title is always the precedent uh, piece of dialogue before the, the conversation of the piece? And so in this case, I'm putting fish tail in at the bottom. So I've got the young boy that I've drawn in pencil crayon that I'll be putting on the left-hand side. The dialogue is largely going to be focused in the center, as you can see with the orange circles. So the young boy will be, sorry, the young boy will be on the left-hand side in the pencil crayon, and so I'll be fitting him into frame and so on. Uh, and then his dad, my intention here is to, to take the dad to scan this into the, into the computer and then when I put it in Photoshop, and of course I'm going to have to link these two pieces of paper together uh, when I scan it as to be one flat image, but I'm going to uh, reverse horizontally the dad because there's something that connects more when you look at a dialogue between characters, there's something that connects just a little bit more if you can have the characters facing each other. So dad's gonna get flipped and uh, so that the fish is going to be facing this way now, okay? And so because of that fact, and planning that out in the way that I did, I should have painted the fish going the other way because ideally I don't want the background fish going the same direction as the foreground fish. I have not painted any volume of space around them. In fact, some of my colors and values and marks have gone over the exterior of each of these fish, but that's because I'm going to take uh, them and cut them out, and then I'm going to replicate them and overlap them at different scales throughout, right? Uh, what? There we go. It's a great comment. This is the life. Sitting at work, bored, watching some cat paint fish and chatting about dusters. Priceless. There you go. If uh, if only I had a big, thick mustache. My, my youngest son's growing a mustache right now, and he, uh, yeah, yeah. It's first mustache time. If anybody that has facial hair, if you remember first mustache. Yeah. Uh, so anyhow, I'm going to scan these guys. And just as I'm going to uh, do the inverse for the pencil crayon father character, I'm going to flip these guys as well. And then I'm going to do multiple copies of them. And I'm going to do different sizes. And I'm going to group them together as a fish. Uh, with uh, an underlying value on the inside of this panel. Uh, so that it'll be a white exterior and, and then there'll be a, a sort of aqua marine value to it. And I might even go so far as to get fiddly 
to do some diffusion over top of these fish to push them back even farther. So just to make a, a nice differentiation between the value on the different the different planes, the foreground plane and the background plane, if you can differentiate those two when you're executing an image. Um, Alex Toth is a, is a, is a quite a proficient designer and he designed an awful lot of the uh, Hanna-Barbera cartoons of the 1960s. And, uh, and so he talked about, and a lot of these guys that came out of the uh, pulp era, the early newsprint periodical era, 30s, 40s, 50s comics, an easy way in order to get depth of field and, and en enough differentiation in the context of, of your panel, of your frame of reference, is to look at it as three separate planes, your foreground, your midground, your background. And if you can look at one of those as being black, one of those as being gray, and one of those as being white, it's going to push one of those, depending on that combination of those and how that works for you, it's gonna push some things forward and some things back because of the contrast. And, and then of course the volume of those values the volume of black is a real deepening thing so if you want if you got a lot of volume of black you want that to be behind um and then if, if you've got uh a high contrast thing you 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 want to put that in the foreground and then of course uh if you have to have any other additional elements like let's say a guy in give me a sec So if we've got, I can't get the lid off. Um, if we've got a composition and in our composition, there is, you know, here's Bob up against the wall. And, you know, he's got, uh, there's his chin and he's got the little light below his face. And as, his, as he moves back, because, you know, a little bit of cast light under his chin, but, as he's pressed up against this wall, because he's being pursued by by mobsters or whatever it is that that are out to kill him, and so he's on the he's on the run and he's trying to hide. There's our narrative. Okay, uh, if we push the values back so that the background is really valued out, then Bob is going to push forward because of that differentiation of value, right? And so that we can have our eye and our focus drawn, you know, to specifically to Bob. And when I mean Bob, yes, this is all Bob, but I want the, the focus to be on Bob's face. And so the way to do that would be, you know, to, to have a light, how can I do this with the same marker? Who are you? You, get over here. So if, if we look at his suit as grayed out, right, and then bring the shadows up from underneath him, that's going to push all of that focus onto Bob's face. And so while it's only a two-plane image, we're still utilizing that same principle rule of contrast. And so when I'm looking at this composition, this guy's dying. As I'm looking at this, other side works better. Hey, hey, you can tell which way this was facing. Um, so as I've got the young man in the foreground, and I'm just largely putting him in in this rough, loose outline shape because I drew dad facing him. Um, but as these two are facing each other, and I've got the fish in the background they're all moving in this way. What I'm really going to do to differentiate the three is to put a crisp line to push this forward in front of the fish and to put, and then the separations between the fish, I'm going to put that hard value of a deep aquamarine blue in order to push the background back. So that's the sort of stuff that goes through my noggin as I'm working. I don't know if other people do that when they're when they're writing and drawing a piece, 
but that's the sort of stuff that I do as I figure out along the way. And as and so part of the process for me, and what do we get? Somebody, oh yeah, Toth was otherworldly. Toth was a uh, was an uh, he had a genius for design and a genius for illustration, and he had managed to boil a lot of things down to simplicity. But the man himself, not nice. So it's don't uh, don't learn too much about your heroes. Um, you know. I don't know about other people, but my process, one of the reasons that I can work in mixed media, one of the reasons that I can work in, in uh, different fundamental approaches from one page to the next is because there is a uniformity in that. There is a, there is a process to it. There is a, you know, in, in my case, it's, it's fairly tried and true at this point, being a thousand years old. And you know, it's uh, I'm the same age as uh, probably most of the people here. Um, it's just that repetition gives us those insights into ourselves and our into our processes, so that once we start recognizing these little connective things, then it becomes a case of well, how can I explore that further, take that apart, and try to find something more in it. And so that's where I'm at at this point, creatively. And so when I'm doing these pages and, and, and I'm executing them in a fairly quick turnover, it largely comes from that foundation of tried and true, you know, uh, continually just working with different medium, continually just trying different, different approaches and different things and seeing how those different combinations work together. So when it comes to trying to understand myself artistically, and it, when it comes to, um, trying to clearly define how it is that I'm approaching, uh, how I'm approaching what it is that I'm doing as a, as a creator and as a storyteller. This uh, is something that I'm still in the process of learning. Yes, but at the same time, uh, I have a fairly solid handle on how I do what I do. I just, I'm still working on the part of def def uh, defining who it is I am externally in the outside world with other creators and other pieces uh, other other people and how they execute their work so for me being able to have these dialogues with people on a regular basis and getting your insights as as i'm doing these these streams and getting people's perspective on their process i i really that really helps me as well not just uh, me blathering but that interaction and those insights on how you associate whatever it is that you're associating to your own work or to your own understanding of uh, your preferred aesthetic. You know, those are those are the sort of things that for another creator or for me as a creator to hear. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a wonderfully informative process that that lets me further my own path and my own my my own exploration in the self. So. What, what do we got here? This use of black concept is something I grasp. In fact, you could say it's my preferred style. Andy, I got to look up your stuff. I got. I'm really excited to do that. That's. Uh, I love to. Uh, I love to hear about stuff like that, and if, especially if you're a person that uses that on a consistent basis, because there's going to be things in, in that dialogue that even if you're just like a big, you know, if, even if somebody does something like, and I'm not specifically saying this towards uh, towards Andy, but. Um, when we identifiably look at other people's work and we identifiably look at um, our influences and we study those and we try to interpret how they go about doing things, you're still going to do it differently. You're still going to, with enough approach and repetition to your own work, you're still gonna have an authentic style. Um, Bill Sienkiewicz is a comic book uh, artist who says that uh, when he was a kid, he really liked Neil Adams' work. And so he would sit down and copy chapter and verse, panels and pages of Neil Adams' work because that's how he thought you learned to be a comic book artist. And uh, I'm sorry if I'm moving around awkwardly because Dingus is over here already climbing on me. So um, anyway, so Bill says this about his approach and uh, and he showed it to, to somebody and I can't remember who the person was that he showed it to and they say, you know, Inking, you can start working right now, but illustrating, you're going to need another year to figure out who you are and how to approach more you. 
And so other people would give him a hard time because they thought, well, you're just, you know, doing what Neil does. But the truth is, is that he learned through studying that other artist. But what he was doing now was exploring how he's going to interpret the same kind of field with his preference to draw as shapes and his preference to draw as, as, uh, as volumes, as opposed to Neil drawing as lines. And so that's where he took his departure and suddenly became the genius that he is today. So um, even in everybody's process and looking at how other people do things, explore it yourself, figure out who you are and how you go about doing it. I've missed something here. Uh, tomorrow I meet my hero, Chris Ronsman. <laughs> I'm not going to believe anything I read about him in the tabloids. It's all true. Every ounce of it's true. Um, yeah, they call me Machine Gun Runciman. Um, I'm dating a Hollywood starlet upstairs. Um, yeah, she uh, she was in Anna Green Gables. Looking for a drink. So, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to Jim Luan tomorrow night, uh, and I being able to sit down to uh, sit down and talk about art. If anybody's able to come on out, I'll show you one more time the uh, the information about that, and uh, right there with a beautiful example of Jim's work. And uh, a character progression there is just great. So if you're able to come on out and join us here, then we'll be there to do that. Um, and then tomorrow, uh, you know, I'll come back when the day is new and I'll have more ideas for you. And you'll have things you want to talk about. I will too. Couldn't help it. Two o'clock tomorrow, I'll be back to, uh, to work on. I got a note somewhere to work on UFO drag racing is tomorrow's one page comic. And uh, I'll be posting this uh, tomorrow morning as I usually do to talk about uh, coming out at two o'clock. Uh, so you'll see this finished page then. And uh, it's a fist joke. This whole page, it's an elaborate amount of illustrative work in order to put together a fist joke. And uh, if that's not uh, the fun of making comics, I don't know what is. So thanks everybody for hanging out. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody for your interactions. Please feel free to to, to do more. Uh, I'm always open to one page. Hold on, I'll go back up to that. I really appreciate the uh, the conversation, everyone. Uh, if you have a one page comic idea for me to do that you can sum up in one or two sentences, feel free to hit me with it, and uh, and we'll work that into uh, the rotation of pages that are being done. In the meantime, have fun. Have fun with your creating. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you tomorrow at 2 uh, or, or and or tomorrow at 8 or tomorrow at 9. Look at that. What an idiot. I already messed it up. Yeah, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Thanks very much. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Bye for now.